Welcome, everyone. I am very pleased to be your moderator today for our discussion of One Health. We are joined by Dr. Megan Davis and Dr. Nico Skirfield, who are going to present some of their um, work and thoughts and ideas around One Health and how uh, we can best integrate this um, concept of One Health throughout multiple aspects of both your work and your and your daily life and how to start um, thinking about these concepts. So I will um, go ahead and I believe that um, Dr. Gerfield is our first presenter today. So please um, note that the Q&A um, uh, panel is, is open and you can start putting all of your questions as they are presenting throughout their talk. And then I will go ahead and I will moderate um, this chat. And once we have um, completed the presentations, we will open it up to, to questions and answers for both of our panelists. So go ahead and, and open that Q&A and, and start providing us with some of your, your questions as soon as you have them. And um, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, and if you have to leave or, or need to go back and, and see something that was discussed today, it will be available at this website and you can go and check that out um, once, the, once the session is over. Next slide. That's me. Hi, I'm Casey Ernst. I'm professor and program director of epidemiology. Um, I am at the University of Arizona at the College of Public Health. Next slide. I think I got ahead of myself with the introductions. I'm very excited to hear these talks. Um, so here are our is our slide with our with our um, speakers for the for the day. Um, they are both um, doctors of veterinary medicine and um, also have their their PhDs. Um, Dr. Nico Skirfield is the county veterinarian and the head at the San Diego County Vector Disease and Diagnostic Laboratory. And Dr. Megan Davis is an associate professor and head of the doctoral program in environmental health and engineering at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. All right, so let's go ahead and, and move on with our, our presentations. Dr. Gerfield, I'll let you take it away. Great, thank you, Dr. Ernst. I am sharing my screen right now. Thumbs up if uh, we can see it and we're good to go. Okay, so cool. One health and vector-borne diseases is what I would like to speak to you all today about. And um, first of all, since this is the, the first talk, we will go over kind of One Health, a brief, brief summary of, of One Health. And where did One Health come from? Well, it can trace, you can trace it back actually to some of the first civilizations, uh, you know, 5,000 years ago or more. But let's just start with this uh, gentleman here, Rudolf Virchow, who is a MD. He taught in medical schools as well as veterinary schools in the 19th century. And he basically said and realized that between animal and human medicine, there is no dividing line, nor should there be. And so he recognized the parallels and the interrelatedness of medicine as pertaining to, uh, as it pertains to animals and, and humans. So this idea then um, was picked up again in the 20th century by a, a doctor, a veterinarian professor named Calvin Schwabe, who coined the term one medicine. And he very clearly uh, said that human health is inextricably linked to the health of animals and the environment, adding that environmental component to the idea that once you, when you focus on human health, you should not just be focusing on, you know, your human subject there, but you have to look at the environment and animals uh, as well to come up with a solution and long-term solutions for human health. So in the past couple of years, then the CDC actually started a One Health office. And if you go to their webpage, you see that they say, One Health is an approach that recognizes that the health of people is closely connected to the health of animals 
and to our shared environment. Again, linking the ideas that human health, animal health, and environmental health are critically important when you target the um, health problems that we face today. And I think you all being part of schools of public health and programs of public health probably are studying and looking at human health in this context, perhaps without even you know, calling it one medicine or, or, or one health here. So by nature, this is a multi-sectoral, transdisciplinary, collaborative uh, effort. And by those, I mean, you know, sectors are, are different areas of, of expertise as are your disciplines. Um, and you need to collaborate because you can't be an expert in every single sector and every single uh, uh, discipline out there. So by nature, you have to collaborate with your colleagues in these other fields and collaborate and work on uh, local, regional, national, and even global levels. And some of the uh, uh, concepts today will go over that. Just as a very small snippet, when you look at infectious diseases, you know, 60 to 70% of all infectious diseases of people are zoonotic, i.e. they have, they've come from uh, animals, they have some kind of animal or vector component, reservoir or, or other component to that, that disease. So I wanna focus particularly on the environmental aspect of One Health and particularly climate, climate's role in vectors and vector-borne diseases. So um, when you look at vector-borne diseases, you got to think about vectors and the reservoirs. So a vector is something like a mosquito, a tick, even a, a rodent for certain diseases. And then they could be the reservoir of that disease in the environment, or there could be another animal reservoir for that. So that's the mosquitoes and birds, for example, is the story for West Nile bars. And <clears throat> There's a dependency on, on vectors and reservoirs on the uh, in, in climactic factors. Pathogens in vector-borne diseases have a dependence on, on environmental and climactic factors, and then as well as humans uh, as well. So I'll discuss kind of the um, how mosquitoes and West Nile virus illustrate these different factors, and specifically precipitation, temperature, uh, and the environment. So looking quickly at mosquitoes, realize mosquitoes go through four life stages. They have eggs, then going to a larva, uh, um, larval stage, a pupil stage, before going to an adult stage. And three out of four of those stages are water dependent. They occur in water, the eggs, the larva, and the pupa. So obviously precipitation, it, one would think is going to have an influence on mosquito uh, biology. We see that then the rate at which the mosquitoes go through these life stages is temperature dependent. And as temperatures elevate, as uh, the climate changes, life, the life cycle will speed up. So for any given number of mosquito uh, eggs out there, you can have higher numbers of uh, adult mosquitoes uh, occurring as your temperature increases. Temperature also affects their longevity and fecundity, their, you know, their lifespan and, and ability to um, foster progeny there, uh, and their ability to effectively, competently transmit diseases. All of these are temperature dependent. How about actual West Nile virus itself? West Nile virus is a flavivirus, single-stranded RNA virus. It's vectored by uh, Culex genus mosquitoes in particular, its reservoir are different passerine types of birds, crows, ravens, uh, jays, uh, and sparrows and robins in particular uh, carry the West Nile virus for long-term and, and can be asymptomatic. So West Nile virus first appeared in the US in 1999. And the strain that happened is found in New York called the New York 99 strain. Well, it's spread east, uh, sorry, westward every year since 1999, reaching California in 2003. And during that time, the virus uh, uh, mutated. And the New York 99 strain ended up being supplanted 
by a West Nile O2 strain, it's called. And, and why did that happen? Well, there are certain fa environmental factors that are thought to have uh, combined with its uh, genetic structure to, to have the influence to, to make it so that it supplanted New York 99 strain, such as it had a shorter external uh, incubation period. That is, once the virus got into the mosquito, it took a shorter amount of time uh, for West Nile O2 to be infectious in that mosquito. And that was a, a temperature dependent transmissibility phenomenon there. There then, there's been a number of uh, other studies and work done to elucidate what is the temperature dependence of uh, West Nile virus in mosquitoes and their transmissibility. So if you look at this graph, just if you want, just focus on the, uh, the red lines there. So you see that across the x-axis, you have days since feeding. So a mosquito feeds on a blood meal that is infected, that has West Nile virus in it, and it either has the New York 99 strain in it or the West Nile uh, virus O2 strain in it. And then it's, um, those mosquitoes are followed and, and tested to see, well, what percentage of those mosquitoes then over time are able to transmit disease. And you see that when the mosquitoes and the virus are incubated at 32 degrees centigrade, that the, they have a much shorter period since uh, being infected that they are able then to transmit uh, virus. The, the fraction, the number of mosquitoes able to transmit is it's much uh, higher than when incubated at lower temperatures. So a very direct effect of the temperature on the transmissibility of West Nile virus. And you see that in the dotted red lines there, that even uh, West Nile O2, again, more transmissible at a shorter amount of time than the New York 99 strain. So again, getting back to this idea that climate, specifically temperature, has a direct effect on West Nile virus. This other study in 20, uh, published in 2020 showing that as West Nile virus spread from uh, New York to, to California over the years, they looked at which kind of environmental factors seem to correlate with that spread. They actually correlated the uh, phylogenetics of the variant strains coming across uh, to different variables. And the only variable that fell out as being significant was the uh, temperature um, as far as this kind of spread. So again, temperature linked at a very, you know, the cellular viral level, as well as then the consequence of, of temperature to uh, a national spread of this disease. So I wanted to look a little more closely than what's happening in California. I'm in, I uh, should say I'm in California here. What happened over the past couple of years since West Nile was introduced to California, um, with regards to precipitation and temperature that we experience. And so I know there's a lot of lines here, but essentially tracing, well, what did our annual precipitation do? That's in the dark green lines. Um, and then uh, on the graph on the left, and then the lighter green lines are the number of mosquito pools that we detected with uh, West Nile virus and the, and the number of human cases. And you see that in California, down there, we, there's a correlation coefficient. And essentially, the correlation coefficient between precipitation and either positive mosquitoes or, or humans, it's almost zero, indicating that uh, there's not a great correlation between them. And in fact, if anything, there's a slight negative uh, bent to that. But you look at the graph on the right, and in contrast, um, when you look at temperature with regards to West Nile virus detections, there's actually a positive correlation. And you see uh, correlation coefficients can go anywhere from negative one to positive one. And if there's and zero in the middle, there's really not a correlation, but there's a positive correlation of 0.5 and 0.4 with both mosquito um, pools being positive and human pools being positive uh, with relation to uh, temperature, which you see as annual temperature has increased over these past 20 years. Looking at San Diego, 
essentially uh, at our own data, a little more closely, you find the same correlation. Basically not a strong correlation with precipitation, but temperature, definitely a, a slight positive correlation with the number of uh, West Nile um, virus positive mosquito pools and human cases that we see out here. But let's, con but let's look at Maricopa County, Arizona, where uh, Dr. Ernst is, uh, resides here. And we see a different picture here, because in fact, on the left in Maricopa County, precipitation seems to be very positively correlated with the number of positive mosquito pools and human cases that they see uh, in Arizona there. Uh, but in contrast, the temperature um, is uh, less so, and it's in a negative fashion here. As temperature increases, you get more of a negative correlation with um, West Nile virus cases. So uh, why, uh, why is that? And um, happy to see if you all have some ideas in the, um, in the chat session, but I think we have to think that um, if I just go back very briefly there, Maricopa is a lot hotter than, it's about 10 degrees average temperature hotter than San Diego in California, for example. And you might expect, well, when the temperature gets higher in Arizona, where, where are people uh, possibly going to be found? Maybe they're driven indoors more and using more air conditioning uh, and then have less of an ability to, or a chance to be bitten by mosquitoes. Maybe that's why we're seeing an inverse kind of a uh, relationship here in, in some cases. So again, just thinking about the environment, yes, and, and climate, we have temperature, we have precipitation, but there's likely then the human element, the human behavioral element or adaptation to uh, climate and, and these factors that can also affect uh, vector-borne disease incidents here. So um, as far as one health sector, it's really just this, this interrelatedness between all these sectors. You have to think about the vectors, the reservoirs, if they're animals, whether they're wildlife or domestic. We didn't talk about fomites today, but these are inanimate objects that can have an effect on disease transmission. And then the environment, whether it is, you know, uh, heat, temperature, sun, rain, and our built environment as well. And that's something that often doesn't get recognized, I feel, in, in One Health, is our built environment, our human interactions in the environment, those definitely need to be uh, considered and addressed as well. So, conclusion, yes, it's complicated. A lot of different factors and particular climate change can have different effects depending on your vector, your pathogen, your location, your lo local effects can uh, differ. Uh, you can have different effects at different ranges. So maybe it's not uniform along the gradient that you choose on, on your climactic variable there. And, and I think clearly there are behavioral, socio, socioeconomic and geographical differences. So solutions to these problems do require one health strategy that targets host reservoir pathogen, as well as the environment. There's this little conference going on right now uh, across the pond regarding uh, climate right now. And so very hopeful that uh, some good work and agreements comes out of that right now. Anyway, that's it. I think we're taking questions at the end, but thank you very much. And I hope I didn't go over, over time. No, that was great. Thank you. I'm, I'm so um, excited to, to see you exploring some of those questions, which I'm very actively engaged in more with 80s aegypti, however, than with uh, the Culex and West Nile virus. So um, we will now have Dr. Davis give her presentation and then we will uh, start our Q&A session. Thank you, Dr. Ernst. It's great to be here and it's super exciting to follow Dr. Gerfield because we both attended UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine and have, I think, the same opinion on the importance of the environment. I'm, of course, sitting within a Department of Environmental Health and Engineering at a school that was founded in part by one of um, Verkow's students, William Osler. So some really great connections there. 
I also just want to take a moment as we are celebrating One Health Day to also honor Native American Heritage Month. And this is something I like to do in all of my classes where I give my students maybe, you know, some reading that they could consider. And these are two authors who really, when I read them, I feel One Health resonating in their words. Um, and so Leslie Marmon Silko and uh, Linda Hogan are two, two of my favorites to share. Just a quick overview, I want to give us some additional motivation and then come back to the concept of what is One Health and how do we practice it? How do we perform One Health research? How do we make One Health oriented programs? And then focus on a specific example with COVID-19 from a health security angle. And we will talk a lot about infectious diseases in One Health, in part because so many are zoonotic or anthropoanotic or in reality kind of bi-directional, but there are also ways in which One Health is really critical to chronic diseases and to other considerations. And so we, you know, have been struggling with an opioid epidemic in humans, and this also has impacts and resonance within the animal health community. So you can see drug diversion and drug seeking behaviors among uh, veterinary professionals as well, where they're experiencing owners who are coming to them asking for drugs for their pets, but in reality they're going to divert the drugs for human consumption. We face similar challenges, not just with climate change, but also with natural disasters, whether or not they're climate driven or not. And so we need to think about orienting animal care services within the context of also co-locating them with how we are providing services for people. And so this is just an example of having to evacuate shelter animals um, in the context of a wildfire in California. And then maybe the classic example from a sentinel species perspective is Minamata disease. And in the 1950s in Japan, the Chiso Corporation was producing fertilizers and acetaldehyde. And there's a catalytic reaction that's used to produce the acetaldehyde that generates methylmercury, which is quite toxic. And this was discharged into Minamata Bay. And kind of famously, what ended up happening was there were, you know, fish in Minamata Bay who were bioaccumulating the methylmercury. And without realizing it, the communities were fishing in these waters that were contaminated. And when they brought the fish back to the shore, a lot of the discards would just go to these cats that would hang out on the docks. And so it preceded human disease that you would start to see neurologic disease in the cats. And they were kind of famously called dancing cats because of the neurologic symptoms. And so this is an example of how the same exposure can cause disease in both people and animals. And that, of course, is the foundation, a lot of one medicine, what Dr. Greerfield mentioned in terms of Calvin Schwabe's work that was you know, descending from Virchow and Osler. But when we think about One Health, the environment is a pivotal component, in fact, an essential component if we're going to do One Health research or develop programs or policies to address major challenges that we face in public health. But you know, there's been quite the argument to add plant health to this paradigm, and I'm, I'm a proponent. And certainly when you think about climate change, you recognize that it also will impact crop quality and distribution, and that will impact animal health, will impact human health, and can also be very important to both the built and the natural environment. And so we've talked about what the conceptual definition of One Health is. Dr. Gerfield went over that brilliantly. But I would also argue that it is a series of approaches or methodologies. And the first one that I want to focus on is how important it is in One Health to engage different stakeholders. You'll hear about this also in concepts like the risk sciences and policies and program development. And it is a really core approach that we use in One Health. And so stakeholders are, can be people, they can be organizations. You can have people who are doing the work who are stakeholders, those who are affected by it. And also decision makers and funders can be really critical stakeholders. And I'll come back to this in the context of our example. 
And then the other methodology that I think it's important to highlight is really using systems thinking approaches. And so what I mean by systems thinking is perhaps best represented in contrast to reductionist thinking. In science, we try to eliminate as many of the other influences to really understand the simple unidirectional or bidirectional relationship between two core components. And that's really important to understand what their relationship is. But in One Health, so many different things are, are kind of tied to each other that you really need to have a more complex approach to understanding the challenges and to proposing the solutions. And so as systems thinking, we're focusing as much, if not more, on the connections than the actual items themselves. And we think about the need to incorporate feedback loops. And so I'll give an example of this related to SARS-CoV-2. So if we wanted to design a feedback policy to really inform a strategy to address a challenge, tagging mask wearing to the local rates of transmission or local rates of positivity is one feedback policy. It goes into effect only after kind of you kick over that threshold and it goes away once you drop below that threshold, much like a thermostat would kick on or kick off if you need air conditioning or if you need heating in a built environment context. So for an example, I wanted to talk about global One Health security. And I'm quite lucky in that uh, we have our Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security actually within my department. And these are my colleagues and collaborators. And these are some of the people you may have heard being interviewed about COVID-19. In fact, I first heard about SARS-CoV-2 very early in January 2020 when we were having our research retreat and some of them came up to me and said, hey, have you heard about this new virus and this outbreak in Wuhan, China? And so that was my first introduction to SARS-CoV-2. And we recognize that it's not just emerging but re-emerging infectious disease threats really are anchored in a need for One Health surveillance efforts and understanding the importance of humans, animals, the environment, and maybe even plants in the greater context of uh, disease emergence and transmission. And so when I say health security, I'm really talking about activities that reduce vulnerability to these acute public health events. They don't have to be infectious disease oriented or pandemics. You can also have bioterrorism, you can have conflict settings, and you can have natural disasters that would really provide a need for a health security oriented approach. And so coming back to stakeholders, one thing we do in One Health is really map the who. Who in terms of expertise, who in terms of discipline, who in terms of ability to take action, who in terms of ability to provide resources or funding do we need to engage? Who in terms of the communities that will be engaged and participate in these work, um, these efforts? And so there are a few very classic global health security stakeholders that really are oriented in a One Health approach. And so the UN has the Food and Agriculture Organization, or FAO. There's the UN Development Program and the World Food Program that are often quite engaged in the global health security agenda. Obviously, the World Health Organization and the World Organization for Animal Health, or OIE. And I'm terrible at French, <laughs> but they have an you know, a more English name now, but began as the Office International de Epezu, and that's why it's OIE. And then, of course, international financial, financial institutions like the World Bank. And so when you have critical events like this is just an example of the Ebola response from 2015, you have a lot of One Health um, efforts that may be needed, even when you aren't necessarily worried about animal to human transmission in the context of that outbreak. Now, a lot of these 
began in wildlife, but then quickly transitioned to dominantly human to human transmission. But then there were opportunities for what is called spillback or reverse zoonosis, where people who were positive for the virus then came into contact with domestic animals and were able to transmit the virus to them. And so this even has implications for like the ethics of how we respond because there was a big debate at that time around what should you do with the pets of people who um, became infected with Ebola? Should they be quarantined? Should they be, you know, euthanized? And then how do you from an environmental health perspective and an engineering perspective prevent further spread or transmission through the environment because we recognize early that Ebola could uh, be transmitted through the environment. And so here we have one of the responders uh, during um, one of the outbreaks actually spraying down the perimeter of um, a hospital, a temporary hospital that had been established to treat patients with Ebola. And I also have a picture of the biocontainment unit that was uh, designed and, and built at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Now, units like a biocontainment unit are designed for maybe one or two individuals. And so when you get something bigger, it's a lot harder to use those on a large scale. Certainly was not very helpful during SARS-CoV-2 once it got going. But there are some major international efforts around health security that are quite oriented at that human animal environment interface. And one of them um, is the PREDICT project. And so this was actually the, the first PREDICT project was headed by one of my former professors at, at UC Davis, Dr. John Mazet. And it really was a global study to try to understand what was out there. And the reason that we have great libraries of genetic information on viruses from many different parts of the world, particularly Africa and Asia, is as a result of uh, PREDICT efforts and other collaborative efforts within that larger context. And so in this project, veterinarians and other stakeholders went out and actually captured wildlife took bio samples, brought them back, built local capacity to do sequencing, and then started to identify and catalog these novel viruses. I also think it's really quite telling that they did catch and release. So they were capturing wildlife, anesthetizing them to take the samples, and then recovering them and releasing them back into their environment. And this was continued through PREDICT2, and we are now at the next generation of projects that are now headed by the Tufts Consortium, and these are called Stop Spillover. But a lot of these efforts really built the library that we were able to use during the early days of SARS-CoV-2 to identify that bats probably were the proximal or, or the kind of back in time origin point for SARS-CoV-2. And then additional efforts really focused on the potential host range. And so again, this is a paper from pretty early in the efforts where they used comparative assessment of the ACE2 receptor, which is where the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 binds to identify which species would likely be susceptible. And as it turns out, much of this has played out and we've seen a lot of these different species um, show up with either antibody positivity or with PCR based positivity or even with disease. I think one of the I remember being a little bit surprised and curious that white-tailed deer were on the list of those expected to be highly susceptible. And then I think it was just this last summer that we found out that there were some studies done in white-tailed deer in the United States that showed that they had antibodies and had likely been exposed and had generated um, an immune response to the virus. And of course, cats have been a big focus, especially exotic cats. And so here we have some of the, um, you know, disease and, and even occasional death in exotic felids that has been noted in captive um, felid groups. So here's a Siberian tiger, but also um, lions and, and other great cats have been affected. But I think one of the, the pieces that I really want to focus on is the mink story with SARS-CoV-2 because I think it's, it's an important piece of what we've experienced so far with COVID-19, but it's also maybe a harbinger of how we need to incorporate 
One Health surveillance efforts into SARS-CoV-2 response globally moving forward. And that's because there was a virus variant that actually bound better to the mink ACE2 receptor than the original variant bound to the mink ACE2 receptor. And we ended up seeing major outbreaks of disease in mink. And in fact, both Denmark and the Netherlands depopulated their mink farms as a control strategy. And this was able to cause disease in minks, transmit readily mink to mink, transmit mink to cat, and transmit mink to human. And in fact, there were people in Denmark who were virus positive for the mink variant who had no contact with mink at all. And so the concern is that there could be new variants in the future that bind better to domestic animal or wildlife ACE2 receptors. And we could even get a more uh, problematic animal reservoir developing where anyone who would come into contact with that animal reservoir might also be at risk of exposure. Because right now, most of our variants, especially Delta, are primarily like predominantly human to human. And another good piece of news is that even though among our pets, we do see positivity and we do see disease, cats are probably the most susceptible of, of that group. And even with those, the cat to cat transmission trails off after a few generations, meaning it goes from cat one to cat two to maybe cat three, and then it really, really drops off based on laboratory studies. But if we had a variant that transmitted better, then we might see more disease in pets, and we might also see the potential for transmission back to humans, which is not something that's very strong right now. And so again, right now, what we're seeing primarily with pets is a reverse zoonotic disease problem and therefore limited cases that are primarily those animals who are directly in contact with positive owners. But to highlight the environment, we've also had a lot of very interesting developments in the context of both sewage and wastewater being positive and therefore potentially infectious, but also something that we can leverage in terms of one house surveillance efforts. And so some of my colleagues are working on this as well, where we're using automated sampling of waste in dormitory settings. This has also been done at the municipal level to identify early spikes. One of the interesting things about SARS-CoV-2 is that you tend to see virus shedding before you see symptoms, which is in contrast to viruses like the flu, where typically you're going to start shedding with symptoms or even after symptoms appear. And so this allows us a little bit of an early warning so that you could put mitigation strategies in place as soon as you see the positivity spikes and therefore try to limit transmission and to uh, basically avoid an outbreak event. And then, of course, there's a great debate about aerosol transmission, which is now, I think, largely settled um, because SARS-CoV-2 does transmit in both droplet and aerosol. And there was an early outbreak that was traced, and according to some of my colleagues who study bioaerosols in the built environment, this was a very poorly designed building from a ventilation perspective and from the perspective of um, sewage management <laughs> within this particular uh, kind of construct. But there was um, an interesting outbreak that was traced to um, a high-rise building and its design was able to transmit from one apartment to another. So um, I think we're at time for Q&A and so I'm going to stop share and I'm excited to see what questions people have. Great, so if you have questions uh, for uh, Dr. Gerfield or Dr. Davis, just reminder that along the bottom of your Zoom window, there is the Q&A tab. So go ahead and um, ask any specific questions you have. We'll go ahead and start with um, some, some questions that, that are already in the chat. Um, a lot of them are, are about sort of curriculum and kinds of things that uh, people can do to push forward the, the information to other communities. So one of these is, are you aware of any One Health oriented curricula being taught in K through 12 
with a broad perspective focused on developing a systems view of the interdependence of human, animal, and environmental health. Great, I can take a little piece of that. So we're not developing any ourselves, but I have heard of curricula that are available or different modules and, and things that, that educators can use. Um, I will see if I can find some of the website links, because as I said, I, I don't actually do this myself. Dr. Gurfield, anything to add to that? All right, that's a fantastic question. And I, I do not know, I do not know of, of any, but I will say that whenever I talk and anybody talks about One Health to students, it's like students get it and they're so excited about it. It's like, oh my God, why, why aren't we doing it? How can I do this for a living? How, you know, this is, this is brilliant, why? But, the, you know, I don't wanna throw too much cold water on it, but as you get up, through the, um, I, I found, I think, you know, through the educational system and, and all this stuff, the, the tendency is for folks to focus and narrow down your focus and you can become an expert PhD and although the letters behind, you know, our names and all that in a very small molecule or something like that. And it really takes, you know, some effort for someone to stay, you know, to maintain the one health perspective and apply their area of expertise to uh, a One Health, you know, mindset, frame set. And it's not to say it's not being done, but it's, um, I, I find a slight disconnect as, as people go through their careers, you know, to be, to be honest. But I think public health, and it'd be interesting, you know, my impression is that schools and, pro and programs of public health you know, you are staying broad and wide and trying to make those connections. Um, it'd be great to have some more classes, you know, specific to One Health in uh, public health programs, you know, they're called it that specifically. Off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm on the soapbox right next to you, but I do have to say it is really great that we now have a CEF requirement for One Health as one of the, the competencies within schools of public health. And so that broadly is going to give most public health students at least a brief orientation to the concept. I yeah, have no idea how that got into place. <laughs> that's great. Um, so I, I, I'll just share, I know one, one resource that is sort of uh, along these lines. Um, so the, the GLOBE, um, uh, project, which they have a globe mosquito project that engages K through 12 groups to, to do things like um, look for mosquito habitat and understand the temperature conditions and precip conditions. And there's some, there's some K through 12 modules on that, that, that may be of, may be of interest. So that's one that I, that I am aware of. Um, okay. So um, there's also questions about curriculum again. So um, how can we, uh, this is a question about One Health curricula. Do you know if there are plans to expand doctoral programs focusing on One Health in the United States? Yeah, so I can say that there are actually quite a few great training programs that have One Health foci. Your degree may or may not say PhD in One Health, but the work you would do would be One Health related. So we have a program at Johns Hopkins in the School of Public Health, and also we train veterinarians and other researchers in molecular and comparative pathobiology. We've been actually training veterinarians for over 50 years uh, within the School of Medicine. But there are quite a few few anchor institutions. I mean, obviously, Dr. Gerfield and I both went to one of them, UC Davis School of Vet Med. Um, but in addition, you do have quite a few others. There's Tufts, there's Duke, there's University of Washington. I'm, I'm not going to be able to remember them all. Penn has a great program, et cetera, et cetera. So no matter where you look, um, there are quite a few programs that have this engaged. And if I've neglected one of yours, it's because there are so many. So if you are interested, just keep kicking the tires or reach out. I'm happy to try to connect you uh, through some of my contacts. Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's, I think that's definitely a growing, growing opportunities for that. Um, so one um, additional student has asked, how can students be exposed to One Health in through their internships? 
Yeah, Dr. Gerfield, do you want to take this from the, the front lines perspective? Because that's where most of the interns end up going. So I am, so I'm a little unfamiliar if as an, in, if you're saying uh, schools of public health require an internship uh, as part of the uh, curriculum and, and to graduate, is that where? There are typically is, practica, is yeah, mm -hmm. there are typically practica required. So yeah, again, depending on your program and your institution, uh, I'm not sure how much guidance they, they give you on all that. So it's probably up to you all to figure out, okay, you know, I know that I want to, you know, do an internship that specifically or focuses on, you know, vector-borne diseases and with a particular emphasis on this, that, and, and the other. And then, you know, you look for that. So I'll just give, you know, um, so I am in with the county of San Diego, and we have a vector control program. So, you know, there's on our human resources page, there's, you know, okay, apply for these types of positions or interns, um, ship possibilities. I think Dr. Um, Ernst is part of something, and we're all part of something from the Pacific uh, Center of uh, Vector Excellence and look up that PACVEC it's called and there are grants and studies given um, you know to encourage students along those lines so um, you know it's looking at there is a one health website I don't think there are several but there is a you know a, a one health um, uh, organization in based in in the U.S know how many uh, internships and opportunities they they post on there but that's probably one place to look also uh, as well yeah and i'll just add that look local to wherever your institution is and you can look within usually departments of health departments of agriculture as well as within academic settings in terms of the kinds of opportunities that you may have to do either internship or practicum oriented work or to do research that's oriented in One Health. And there are maybe some additional opportunities you might consider through AAAS fellowships or through ORISE fellowships or CDC's EIS programs. They have both the, the EIS and then they also have laboratory based programs for fellows that a number of our students have done. And these can be great ways of, of kind of segueing, especially as you are finishing up an MPH, a DRPH, another master's or doctoral degree in terms of your next steps if you want to do something that would be within an institution um, or government program that might have one health orientation in terms of the kind of work it does. Great, and then sort and of the, oh, go ahead. Yeah. On that, so just one other thing is that, uh, what Dr. Uh, Davis just said, look to your local organization and furthermore, look to your own faculty there because many of them have grants from the NIH, I, I would assume. And for a while, National Institutes of Health, and for a while, in order to get a grant from the NIH, a big grant, you had to show that your grant was a collaborative multidisciplinary grant. Uh, which is essentially one health is what we're talking about here. But even if your your faculty member was studying, you know, this particular disease, they had to bring in folks that were uh, not part of the same, you know, expertise, but that could add value to the NIH's grant proposal, you know, from another perspective. So if you go to your faculty and say, hey, you know, I'm interested in doing something that's you know, transdisciplinary, multi-sectoral, you know, throw out those kind of terms regarding your project, they might be able to link you to essentially what is a One Health uh, uh, internship or program project. Yeah. Great. Okay, so we'll switch gears here a little bit and, and address a question that came early in the chat, which is um, when, when discussing the history of One Health, how is that connected to the indigenous ways of life, culture, and belief? And I believe you touched on that a little bit, um, Dr. Davis. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think one of the things, if you look at the mm, 
academic and programmatic history of One Health is that it, it doesn't have as deep connections as maybe we should have, uh, given that a lot of Indigenous communities are really tied to the land and tied to sustainable systems of food growing and relationships with the land and animals in the area with with a lot of very deep cultural context. And so I think it is perhaps an oversight within kind of our history books of One Health that, that we don't have deeper ties. Thanks, Dr. Davis. Um, and, and a follow up to that, there's a uh, pushing on this, these equity and, and issues of <clears throat> Sort of environmental racism, one of the attendees asks, what are the perspectives on environmental racism, specifically with the African American population? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And we do work on environmental justice. So thinking about drivers of environmental injustice and solutions, which would be justice solutions uh, to these challenges. And so I'm a native of Baltimore. I grew up here. And one of the things that um, has been really challenging is the history of redlining in our communities. And so for those of you who don't know what that is, it's basically there were maps that were drawn. Some communities had red lines drawn around them because they were considered to be high risk for um, lending security. And as a result of these practices, you had systematic disenfranchisement of entire communities. So a lack of investment in infrastructure, in expertise in development of the communities and, and kind of sustained resource investment. And so there have been some um, some litigation. And as a result of that litigation, the housing voucher programs were born. And Baltimore has a very well established, very large housing voucher program. So we've been working within this program. And as a part of this program, people who are living in historically redlined areas who want to move, this is not a relocation program, who want to move are given vouchers so they can move to what's called a neighborhood of opportunity, a neighborhood that's had more investment over time. And we've been looking at asthma and allergy in kids and following kids with asthma whose families do move through this voucher program. And so one of the things that we're looking at is what does this mean in terms of their pet ownership? <laughs> what does this mean in terms of their microbial exposures? What does this mean in terms of their green space and exposure to green space from a psychosocial perspective and also green space from a microbial perspective? You know, the environments themselves may be quite different. And so we're in process um, on that. So I don't necessarily have any findings, but I do think that it really defines kind of the importance of context. And one of the contexts that we see over and over again is also that these communities have poor access to healthcare services, and they also have veterinary care deserts, so very poor access to veterinary care services. And so we've been looking at the health of pets within these communities and also looking at how they access veterinary services and have identified that the majority of pets within these communities don't access veterinary care or have not accessed veterinary care in the prior year. And that can have a direct impact on their health and longevity. The other thing that we see from a One Health perspective is that when you're living in poor housing stock, that is buildings that haven't had investment, they haven't had upkeep, they haven't you know, had roofs repaired and cracks in the walls replaced, that you also see a higher proportion of pest infestation. And so this would be like mice who can literally chew through walls. Their teeth are amazing. And that's a major driver of allergy and asthma. And it's also a driver of allergy and asthma sometimes in pets. And so these allergen exposures are very, very high. And it's not limited to residential settings. We've also found this in school settings and specifically tied to um, infrastructure that has not been kept up. 
So that's just one example, but I think that there are many different ways in which you can think about One Health from this, including from a sentinel species perspective. Because if you, for example, have a community located near a source of pollution that is a toxicant, so a metal or a chemical that could cause disease, then animals are going to be living 24 seven if they're domestic animals within that same community. Whereas maybe adults who are workers are going to commute out of that community and come back. And so the animals may be a better sentinel for exposure of, for example, kids who might be living in that same community all the time. And so there have been some really interesting research um, foci that have looked at whether you can do the um, so there are the silicone wristbands you've seen for measurement of exposure to different toxicants that people will wear they've been making them for pets and so you could put one on a pet and then use that to understand what the home exposure is compared to what the exposure is of someone who may go to school or may go to work Sorry, that was a bit of a long-winded answer. No, that's that's <laughs> fascinating. I think I think you really touched on so much of that sort of the intersectionality as well as the the complexity of these relationships. Um, it is it is not straightforward, and um, one exposure can mean many different impacts on health outcomes. Um, so, getting to uh, now that we're sort of getting towards the end of our time, I want to talk a little bit about some questions in the chat, which are sort of what what can we do? What should we do to start addressing these One Health challenges that we face? Um, we have a, a respondent from from somewhere in Sub-Saharan Africa who says, I ask, they asked a question about what do we do? Are we supposed to be trying to keep humans and animals separated to prevent this spillover or of disease and they they indicate they ask the question because when we make observations most of the disease with high mortality and morbidity morbidity are animal related um, for example covid ebola zika toxo um, here in africa it really is a challenge to eradicate these diseases so what are some ways forward that both of you can can kind of share with us before we close Right. Dr. Gerfield, do you want to go first? I feel like I've been talking a lot. <laughs> That's a huge question. There's no one simple answer to that. And I think in essence, we are advocating that, you know, um, each particular situation has different components that have to be considered, right? And, and what's happening in your uh, situation in Africa you know, has a whole bunch of complex drivers that are probably different than me sitting in San Diego here in California, right? But it's that idea of you need to ask that those questions that we're saying, well, what is the animal component? What's the, the human co uh, environmental component? And what is the human component? Meaning how do these interact? And that's to your specific question of how can we keep, you know, people and animals safe and such like that by analyzing each of those three kind of you know variables and, and, and sectors, the, the solutions will become apparent. And that is different than what is done in the past where people would have just said, oh, well, we have you know X, Y, disease X in people, we need to find an antibiotic that's going to cure that, right? Very narrow focus, very limited and very short lived. So it's looking at the totality of your system to answer the, that question and to keep people safe and, and to keep everything safe, essentially. Yeah, I completely agree. But I would also say that it's not necessarily about separation of people and animals. We know that animals are absolutely critical for human health early life exposure to diverse farming environments, to pets, and this could be in utero, this could be within the first two years, does in multiple birth cohort studies show a protective effect against the development of allergies and other kinds of diseases that are, that are associated with the immune system's early development. We know that 
having animals around us is beneficial often for our mental health and for our well-being. I think anyone who thought about or did adopt a pet <laughs> during COVID-19 recognizes the important services that they can play. And we've been studying therapy dogs in hospitals, right? And so these are settings where infectious diseases are rampant and there's a lot of you know, concern for infectious disease transmission. And so we've been working not just to, to say, oh yeah, this could be a problem that there's infectious disease transmission, but instead to say therapy animals serve a critical function for hospitalized children and other patients. They also serve a critical function to help support healthcare workers that are under a great deal of stress. So what can we do to target strategies that would help us mitigate the risks and enhance the benefits? And so I think that that's really what we're talking about is where can we kind of close down the risks, reduce the risks, and make sure that we're not impacting or lessening the benefits of these critical relationships. We've barely talked about food systems, but food systems are another way in which this is, this is critically important. And if we take the great antibiotic example, if you improve animal husbandry, and if you think about the entire process from the farm to the processing plant, to the distribution networks, to the consumer, then you have many different places where you can locate strategies to reduce contamination of the products that go to market and therefore reduce the exposure so that you don't even necessarily need to use antibiotics in the people or in the animals. That's great. Thank you both for those final thoughts. So we have a couple of um, last minute housekeeping here to show you um, if you found that this um, was a, a good uh, session that you would like to share with others. This is some information about um, so where the webinar is uh, recorded and where to find it later and then go back to the next slide. Sorry, I started with the, the wrong thing. Um, so there are also two upcoming events that are going to be um, in November, the PIPH Graduate School Mini Fair, as well as the Virtual Graduate School Fair um, powered by Career Eco. So please do come to attend these two events and um, check out the, the webinar session and, and share it with folks that weren't able to attend as soon as that's posted. So thank you all for attending and um, I hope you all learned a lot for One Health Day today. <laughs>